thank you all so much for coming today. Um, so we have a presentation about how to plan your summer garden. Um, our presenter and garden expert today is Josh Gordon from, um, he's the Giving Gardens Manager at Yad Ezra. So um, Yad Ezra opened its doors in 1990 to provide kosher food to vulnerable Jewish families in Southeast Michigan. The Giving Gardens and its educators strive to educate the community about the concept of farm-to-table food and other resources and opportunities to encourage people to eat more fresh produce and be more self-sufficient. So I'll turn it over to Josh. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming out today. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, we're going to talk about some garden planning and some ways to, if you don't have your garden oriented, how to maybe plan where you're going to put it, things like that. Um, if you have questions throughout, feel free to just interrupt me, raise your hand, whatever. It's more conversational the way I like to teach, so don't feel like you know raising your hand is going to throw me off too far. Um, if anything is confusing, also feel free to ask clarifying questions and all that kind of fun stuff. Uh, just a quick plug about me and what I do. As uh, was mentioned, I work at Yad Ezra. We have uh, we're a food pantry, we serve about 1,500 families, and we give out about a million pounds of food a year. So um, we have gardens on site. Obviously, I don't have acres and acres, so I'm more of a drop in the bucket, but I try to produce food that's more culturally irrelevant, so things that maybe we're not going to buy, you know, uh, by the pallet. So not like as many potatoes, but maybe like fresh herbs like dill, which are really important for the people who we serve, but you know, you're not going to buy a pallet of dill that's going to look beautiful and change a meal. So just a very quick, you know, overview. And if you have questions, I can also answer a million of them at the end. Um, just a quick overview of what we're going to go through today. I'm going to talk about a little bit about like plant families and why that might be important, how you might plan where you're going to put your garden, uh, maybe things that you can put together or things that don't want to be put together. Space is really a lot of times important in garden settings that we are like that we're in, in you know, more city-like places. A lot of times that I've found people's problem with planting may be that they planted something at the wrong time. And just like how you might not want to be out on a 90 degree day every day, some plants don't like that either. Um, about maybe rotation and things like that. Thinking about maybe if you want to do your own transplants. And uh, then at the end I'll go over like a quick overview of how I've done this at my own house. Um, also, I'll do one last plug before I get into this, and I'm going to plug it again at the end. One of the main things that we actually do is we have a garden resource program at Yad Ezra. So I have about uh, 20 varieties of seeds and seedlings that are available to the community, all on donation basis. We also have compost available, tool share. Uh, it would be a far drive for you guys, but we have little beds that you can rent out and things like that. So um, there's green sheets there if you're curious, or there's a QR code. Uh, it's due, all applications are due by the 8th, and we have pickups from the 15th to the 21st, and we have, as I said, like 20-something varieties of plants. So anything you want for your home garden, as far as veggies, we probably have. Um, I'm going to dive into it. Uh, here's a little overview of plant families, and this can be important because a lot of times problems for uh, your plants that you're growing may be specific to a family. So like things that are closely related may deal with the same issues or have the same success in your garden. So it's important to know, uh, not don't break you know, your back trying to learn them all. Uh, an important thing that like, I think is interesting is so a lot of things we grow are in the solanum family and the brassica family, which is the solanum is like tomatoes, potatoes, peppers, uh, tobacco's in there too, and there's like a lot of things like that that you may grow in your garden that are all in that same family, so a lot of those may get the same pests. Um, also, in the broccoli family or the cabbage family, which is the brassica family, we grow a lot of things, and it gets to the point where honestly all of these, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, kohlrabi, kale, broccoli, cauliflower, all come from wild mustard. So they're all actually the same exact plant, kind of like how a pit bull and a poodle or like a dachshund are all a dog. You know, we've taken time through selection and selected for either, you know, how the flowers grow for like broccoli or cauliflower or just nice leaves with kale or the fact that they grow little heads along all their nodes for Brussels sprouts. 
but it's one of those if you are having issues with one of them and you try to grow the same, you know, you're like, oh, I didn't do well with cabbage, and you try to grow broccoli, you'll probably run into the same problems um, or the same success. Um, a lot of times when we're thinking about how we're going to plan our yard out or where we want to put our garden, it's important to think about how often you might be going to a space. This is an example of if you had like a much larger space, but I can give you how I use this for like my house. So like zone zero is like immediately around your house, things that you're going to see all the time, could get a lot of access. Zone one, as you can see in this, would be like things that you might need, pretty regular maintenance if you had like compost piles or something that you're going to want to go to pretty often because you have kitchen scraps or if you have animals or things like that. Then you might get into areas where you're like, oh, I don't go to, like, I don't need to go see my fruit trees all the time. I just need to check them every once in a while. Um, for me, it's like my zone two might be like, literally, I can throw a ball to that point. And then I don't have zone three, four, and five. I consider zone five going to like the park. So it's like nature space that you would walk around that's like not very well maintained. Um, but sometimes it's nice to think about how often you might use something and that helps placement of things. Uh, sun is really important for plants to grow. So a lot of times you gotta think about where the sun might be, how much actual sun you're getting in your location. Um, you might look at your house and be like, oh wow, I really don't have much that faces south. And you can maybe try to find things that grow in a little more shady, but it's a good way to think about do you have enough sun to plant the, the things that you really want to grow? Or do you have to maybe think about it in another way or try to figure something else out that might work? Another thing to think about is the sun is not in the same spot all year. So it's not something that I used to think about, but in the summer, the sun's right overhead. In the winter, it's kind of low in the sky. So if you're like trying to do like a greenhouse and you have like, for example, Yadas or a greenhouse is like tall brick walls, which means in the winter, I don't get sun on most things. It's something that wasn't thought about beforehand, but like if they had thought about it, my success rate would be much higher. Um, as far as location, this might look like a great spot. People always want to put their garden in the back of their yard just because it seems like a great spot. It looks good and all that, but how often do you go to the back of your yard? Probably not very often. So if you're putting something back there that needs regular maintenance, even just maybe to be looked over every once in a while, and you're like, oh, I don't know, I don't feel like it today. And that could become two, three weeks. And all of a sudden, your garden hasn't seen water, weeding, any attention, not even a footstep in a long time. So it's important to maybe put your garden closer to the house. Also, if you think about it, and you have to drag a hose out here to water, all of a sudden, you have to drag 50 feet of hose, which doesn't seem that bad until you have to do it all the time and it's like a CrossFit workout. And it's not my favorite, I've done it a lot, but it's trying to think about maybe those little things. I mean, you can see the hose reel is, hopefully I can work this, is all the way there. It's not that far, but like every time you wanna water, which is every couple days, every few days, they gotta drag all that hose out and then wind it back up. To me, that just doesn't seem worth it. There are other options, you maybe could put you know, a hose that stays out all the time and the reel's closer, but just trying to think about, you know, where's your water access? How easy is it to get that water? Because plants do need water unless you're planting something that's really drought tolerant. Um, but the back of the yard is always where people seem to want to put their garden. I always try to push people not to. There's a dude who uh, talks about permaculture and he says, if you go outside to harvest your herbs in the morning and your socks get wet, your garden's too far away. <laughs> so, you know, really trying to put that as close to you as you can. Um, this is another example. You can see this one's right against the house. That might be better, but also then you can see, I'm not sure because I can't really tell exactly what's going on, but the shade's starting to come in. This might not be the right side of the house. I can't tell from this photo, but again, thinking if you put it close to your house, did you all of a sudden just put it on the north side and that wasn't a good thing. So there's a lot of factors that go into this and you know, sometimes you may have to throw one thing to the wayside to make everything else work for you but just trying to keep as much as you can in your head about how easy it is to go at things and make it work for you and the plants because we don't want to create more work for ourselves because then you're probably not going to put the time into your garden because it's a hassle just to go out and water. So if you make it as easy as you can, then you're more likely to have success because you're excited to do things instead of sad.
Um, another thing that people oftentimes think is they think of gardens as just this. You have a bed in your yard and that's the only place that you can grow your food. That's it, you can't grow anything outside of there. This is an example of maybe a beautiful setup that you could still keep up with the Joneses, but you could have a lot of things mixed in. Uh, you can't fully see, but there's like parsley, bergamot, chives, calendula, lavender, sage, fennel, all these crazy plants mixed in here, a lot of the herbs. It looks beautiful, it creates a great space. You get to keep up with, the, you know, with your neighbors. They're not gonna be like, why is your garden overgrown? It looks beautiful. Even has a place for you to sit. Again, a lot of times the most important thing for a garden is just to be out there and see what's happening. Because if you don't look at your garden all the time, you can't tell when something's wrong because you don't know what it looks like when it's right. So it's being able to tell when something's going wrong or you're out there. For me, I love making a lot of tea. So a garden like this with a lot of herbs that make great tea is perfect. So again, maybe yours won't look you know, as great. This is also a picture. You can imagine in reality, it might not be as tidy. But it's the idea. So thinking about your garden maybe instead of just as that wood box in your backyard is maybe like mixing in some flowers that also maybe you can use or something like that or a pretty plant that might fit into your flower bed instead of just having it be in that back corner. Um, people oftentimes want to start really big. Uh, I know a lot of people are like, I'm going to put in six raised beds. And I'm like, have you ever gardened before? I'm like, no. And then, then I'm like, maybe, maybe back off a bit. Um, this is like one of the beds. These are actually the beds that we, um, if you wanted to rent a bed and you don't have a space, because a lot of like, uh, our people maybe are living in like condos and stuff, so we, we have beds for them, or their apartments without a patio even. Uh, this I believe is like, like, it's either eight or 10 feet by like three and a half, four feet. So it's not a very large bed. But in here, uh, this was my like example home raised bed. There's uh, tomatoes in the back kale, there's uh, green beans, zucchini, there was some ground cherries, there's eggplant, and they all did pretty well. And as far as maintenance, I planted this and we trellised the tomatoes every like week or two and harvested. And that was about it, you know? Pretty simple, makes it so you wanna do things. Again, if all you have to really do is harvest, it's fun to go to the garden. Obviously there's a little more to it than that, but like it wasn't a whole lot of maintenance. It's not a very big bed. And if you're just a small family, that's enough to like accent some meals here and there. If you're the type of family that's like, yo, we want a ton of green beans. Maybe you do a whole bed in green beans though. Cause you're like, oh, I, cause I know me, I'm, if I'm eating green beans, I want a big old pot. If I got two or three people, we better have a massive pot of you know, green beans and some garlic next to it. And there was garlic in here as well. <laughs> um, as I keep going, are there any questions? Just, okay. Um, as I mentioned, it's a, a, like one of my favorite things to do, especially on small scale, is companion planting. And if you grab the, the flyer or the handouts, there's some, a couple of different ones about companion planting. I like the one that looks like this. Uh, the other one's prettier, like aesthetically. And then if there's not any more, I can also send out some. Um, it shows who their friends are, who maybe isn't their friend, and maybe what the, the reasoning is for why they might be going well together. Um, you may have heard of like tomatoes and basil getting planted together. Not only is that a very good combo, if you, know, you eat it in the garden right there and then, um, it's also, the basil is supposed to make the tomatoes more flavorful. I haven't done a side-by-side -side or seen statistical research, so you know, hands off on that one, but it works well. And as you can see in the space, it makes sense too, because the basil gets to grow underneath the tomatoes. You're not taking up any more space. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to say, I always cook with the tomatoes. And a lot of it is because if I plant basil in the summer, it just bolts. But if it's got the shade. The shade. The plant, it doesn't tend to bolt. And I feel like the bugs don't like the plant as much. It helps a little bit. You'll see a lot of the times they say the reason might be is that there's other ones like if you've ever grown squash, they a lot of times get squash beetles or cucumber beetles. And if you plant nasturtium around there, the flowers are the same color and they'll get confused and go to the wrong flower. And so they're not eating your squash and like massacring them. So there's, sometimes there's logic behind it and sometimes it's just they happen to work well together without hurting each other. Um, I oftentimes started doing parsley underneath my tomatoes 
because I realize parsley goes well at the pantry I'm at, so it helps to be able to grow more of that. So there are other options, you know, but like it works well. And then there's other reasons like the shade from the tomatoes helps keep your basil from bolting too quickly. So sometimes there may be more benefit than you realize. Um, I think it's also a great way to, again, just mix in as much as you can all together. And as I mentioned before, there's some times where you might see things aren't supposed to be mixed. I'm a type of person who likes to push my limits. So sometimes I've either by happenstance or purposefully planted enemies, enemies together. And a lot of times they still did fine. Um, so, you know, if you really want to grow your whatever's together and they're not supposed to like, maybe try it one year and see if it's actually as bad as they say. You know, if, especially if your space is limited, uh, don't, don't feel like you have to live everything like it's law. Sometimes rules are meant to be broken. Um, an important thing to think about as well is your soil preparation. So there's some ways to look at this and then I can go into some other little niche categories of this. I could spend many hours talking about soil, so I'll keep this succinct as possible. Um, one of the things that's important to look at is maybe what texture your soil is, or like if you look, a lot of times soil in Michigan is clay, so it's very hard, uh, especially if it's, if you're at a house, a lot of times they purposely hard pack that when you're, uh, when they're building so that they can drive their machinery on it, and then you're working pretty much with like what feels like cement in the summer, because it dries out and just gets so hard. You can take a little, just like a little dig of your soil, like six inches deep, and if you throw it in a jar, which is what's going on here with this mason jar soil test, and shake it up, and then just wait, they'll, all the layers will settle out based on their particle size. So first we'll, the sand will settle out, then the silt, and then the clay, and it may take, the sand will probably settle out immediately, the silt within you know, an hour or two, and the clay might take 24 hours. So you might shake it and check the next day. And you'll actually be able to see pretty distinct layers and then you can kind of see what your soil is and you can go through one of these charts and tell. Yeah. Are you going to go through, what if right now we just, we're building the garden, mm -hmm. the raised bed, and I need to bring in soil. Yes. Do you have recommendations on what to put in it all? Or? Uh, yeah, so I can go into that as well. So okay. um, as far as, so like if you're building up, a lot of times building up is also a great idea if you're not sure, if, you're, if you know your soil's bad underneath or there's other, some, sometimes other worries, like a lot of you probably bought a house and when you bought it, you signed a thing that said you know there's lead paint on it. So within the first few feet of your house, you gotta assume there might be lead there. And you don't wanna be trying to eat something healthy and all of a sudden you're actually just eating lead infested <coughs> plants. So building up is you know, oftentimes the greatest, greatest way to avoid that. If you go with something like straight compost, a lot of times plants will grow really well, but they'll get, grow so quickly that they'll actually get a bunch of pests. So they don't have the time to build really strong walls. They're just kind of building quickly without taking the time to add the bracing. Um, so I recommend a mixture like a topsoil compost mix. Um, I've worked with a company called Spurt. They're out of Wixom. I'm not sure how much delivery is to here, but they do little deliveries of, you know, under three to 10 yards as well. So it's not like you got to get a 30 yard, you know, truck. And they do a 50-50 a topsoil compost mix that works pretty well. Um, I'm pretty sure Country Oaks would probably have a similar mix. Uh, they're probably... So 50-50 topsoil? Yeah, give or take. I honestly, if I was doing it myself, I'd probably do 33% compost, like a third. You know, if I was making it all myself and do like peat or leaf mold or something like that. Uh, sometimes you can find a landscape company that, you know, they collect the leaves in the fall and then they got to pay to go drop them off at a place like Spurt. And so if they can drop it off at your house, that saves them money. So you can sometimes use something like composted leaves as some of that bulking material just to like water down that compost and make it so it's not so rich. Mm -hmm. um, but it depends, you know, how much, how in depth, how hands on you want to be with the mixing. If you're just trying to get some stuff to fill it, I'd say call, you know, one of those companies and they should have a, like a 50-50 mix or something like that that they suggest for raised beds. Perfect, thank you. Um, yeah, so you can, as I said, you can see what your soil texture is. A lot of times, you know, you'll hear like, people are looking for those loams. I don't know if you ever heard of the infamous, you know, you got great loam around here, great for growing stuff. Um, things, are, things are always interesting with soil types. I will say I've, 
we're in Michigan, so almost everything I've grown in is straight clay. I was lucky I had one farm was on sand, which was nice, you know, I got to control irrigation, but being on clay can be interesting because it, A, it turns into cement when it dries out, and B, water can sit in it. So another test you can do if you want to see how your drainage is, is you can just dig a little hole, throw some water in it, and see how long it takes for that water to disappear. That's an infiltration test, so you can tell, like, if I get a bunch of rain, I build this rain bed, am I just building a pond? And, you know, plants, they like water, but they don't want to sit in water. So we like, we like to have pools, but you sit in that pool for too long, and you're going to be in trouble. So it can be nice to test with something like that to see, you know, what do I really need to do? How is my soil looking? Uh, one fun thing about this, though, is if you have sand, compost will help hold water and keep it from you know, drying out too quickly. And if you have clay and you add compost, it'll help it infiltrate quicker. So compost is the solution to most of your problems here. Yeah. Yeah, my base is clay. I've got yep. probably three inches of topsoil. Yep, and then just and straight it's, clay. It's hard yep. cement clay. Yep. It's lovely. Um, there are some other options that you can do, especially like right now while the clay's still wet. You could do something like there's things called like broad forks. I don't have a picture. It's pretty much a massive pitchfork. Mm -hmm. You kind of just like use it to pull up and lift the soil without having to till it. And that'll add some air in and help make it so the roots can grow in there a bit. You could, uh, I've done things where I grow this, like uh, if you've ever seen a daikon radish, it's like a big long radish. They also call them tillage radishes. You can, play, you can grow those and sometimes they'll do the work of, you know, getting into that clay, especially if you plant them at the right time, and then they'll help break up that clay layer for you, because those clay layers are fun, to say the least. The other option is, as you're doing, just build up. You know, just bring stuff in and say, you know, sooner or later the roots will find their way into it. They're gonna want that water that's in there in the summer, and they will kinda slowly get there, but everything takes time. Um, as I mentioned, it, something that's really important, a lot of times people ask, you know, like, I planted peas, and they didn't do anything. And I'm like, when would you plant them? They're like, I planted them in July. And I'm like, well, peas die off by, like, mid-June, because they can't handle more than three 90-degree days. <laughs> Time to plant peas was actually April 1st. So, um, but, again, another thing that comes in with this is you'll see there's timings. And I have a little thermometer here, because a lot of that timing is not really based off of that exact date, especially as you know, our climate changes a bit and every year is different than the last. It's more important a lot of times to go off of soil temperature. Um, so like the peas, I'm actually not looking for April 1st. I'm looking for when I stick that thermometer in and it's 50 degrees. You may notice 50 degrees is about the point where you're like, I don't know if I fully need a jacket. But in the 40s, you're like, oh yeah, I need a jacket. In the 50s is when the, the biology of the soil starts to wake up and actually do their thing. A lot of your fertility is driven by the biology, so it's important to make sure that that's doing its thing, otherwise you're, what you're growing is sitting there trying to do all the work itself without all of its friends around. So you're waiting for that, all that to wake up, and 50 is when that starts to wake up. And similarly, like everyone's like, I wanna plant my tomatoes, and I'm like, it's not time yet. That soil's still too cold. You throw their roots in there, and they're gonna, they're gonna be shivering. They might live, they might make it through, but they're going to be sitting there just struggling for a while. Whereas if you wait that extra week or two when we have these 70 degree days that heats up the soil, they'll be going in, all their friends will already be partying, and they can just start doing their thing. So um, you can see there's also something that I've enjoyed a little more as I've like, continued gardening. Fall planting is oftentimes my favorite time to plant things. Um, like especially like kale and collards and cabbage and things like that. You may have, if you're familiar with collards, heard of like, oh, have they been frosted? What they mean is have they been through a frost? Because they'll all live through a frost and what actually happens as it gets colder is they start to, they can feel that that cold is coming and they have to kind of make uh, a way for them to not freeze when it gets below freezing. And if you've ever seen how like salt water doesn't freeze at 32, it freezes below, they're actually putting sugars into their cells as that salt to help lower that freezing temperature. So they get sweeter. And so like if you get winter spinach, it tastes delicious. Once it gets hot again, that spinach doesn't have that same sweetness because it's all of a sudden making other chemicals to make sure it can deal with 90 degree heat. So when you plant things in the spring, they're ripening up as it gets really hot. So they're getting to the point where they're starting to struggle 
to stay alive. Whereas in, if you plant them in the fall, they're getting into that point where they're starting to sweeten up so they can stay alive. So I enjoy fall planted things a lot more a lot of times. I still do spring because I'm really excited about things. But I've started doing a lot more fall stuff. The only problem with that one is timing it because unlike in spring plantings, the, once it gets beneath that temperature that they can handle, they're RIP. So you got to make sure that you're planting it early enough, but not too early so that you can hit that window, which is, if you can see, there's little dates for starting things and all that here. And you can probably check online. There's other, other ways to see. And you can also reach out to me and I can tell you when I'm planning on planting something. Um, you can see like this is how I oftentimes do some of my crop plans. Um, everything is coordinated with colors. The colors coordinate to plant families so that I can do rotations on my farm. Um, you'll see there's little dates and usually those are planting dates. Um, a lot of times you'll see like numbers. So this is like BLSG means baby leaf salad greens. And the one, two, and three is different successions. Because if you plant all of them at once, they'll be all ready at once. And I don't need 50 feet of baby leaf salad greens all at the same time. But maybe 15 feet, you know, every couple weeks is something that is more sustainable. So that's another way to think about things is like maybe you can plant something instead of planting it all at once, you plant it, you know, a few times throughout the year so that you have it, you know, not all at once. Because the other thing is like, what do you do with a bushel of radishes or something, you know, but if you have a few and you like salads, you're good. But like, I hope you're planning on pickling otherwise. Um, it can be important for, for things like that, though, to, to also think about maybe not putting all your eggs in that one basket. Other reasons that succession planting could be important is uh, one of the questions I oftentimes get is, my cucumbers are doing great, and then all of a sudden they just stopped. Cucumbers seem to have a lifespan of producing for like two weeks. Everyone thinks that they should go on forever because you're like, yeah, they just should just keep going. But they usually succumb to some type of disease or something. So you don't want to just like, like have all your eggs and be like, oh, I want cucumbers all year. You're not going to get them all year unless you don't plant them all at the same time. Or you have the healthiest plants and healthiest soil ever, in which case I applaud you. <laughs> um, another random thing is there's also, as I mentioned, is crop rotation. Crop rotation is important mainly if you're on larger scale farms. If you have a raised bed and you're planting there and then you move it to there, the roots were throughout the bed. And if you're trying to avoid pests and like a little larva pops up here, they're going to find something within you know, your yard. So as much as I believe in crop rotation, don't, don't feel like it's something that you've got to like prescribe to with, with a bunch of vigor and like do a bunch of research on. Because it really doesn't like, if you have a 500 acre farm, you know, a 1500 acre farm, it makes sense that you can move something a mile away. But in your yard, that's not really an option. Um, if you are curious to look at into it a lot more, this uh, is actually a free resource online. I'm pretty sure the PDF is available. So feel free to look into that. Again, it's like a whole rabbit hole you can go down. I went down it and then kind of was like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> um, as I mentioned, transplant production is really, like, it's fun. This is actually a picture of the greenhouse from the last couple days. As I said, we start, this is just a little piece of the greenhouse. We start thousands of plants because if you guys want your plants, please come get them. Um, it can be a, it's one of those, you better be ready for, transplants are a lot of care. Uh, people always ask, it's kind of like taking care of an infant. You know, big plants are a little more, they can find their own food, they can do their things. These ones are relying on you exclusively and they're in this much soil and take some effort. Um, at the same time, it's really doable. I mean, these setups, I've bought a lot of lights. The lights that are on these are $20 lights from Harbor Freight. Shop lights, nothing special. I have $100 grow lights through that out there, and then I also have $20 lights from Harbor Freight. And I can't tell the difference of the plants at the end. So don't feel like you got to spend a bunch of money. Maybe if you want to try something when you're bored in you know, the spring, it's not that hard to go get a couple lights and a little soil and you know, throw some seeds in the ground. They might even have seeds here at the library. Um, but yeah, it's just a, a quick touch on transplant production. I don't want to go too deep into it. but. It is doable, and you don't have to invest too much money and all that, but you're probably also better off just getting them from someone like me or et cetera. Um, any questions before I dive into like the, the nitty gritty of putting these pieces together? Yeah. Have you ever tried winter sowing? 
Uh, some stuff. Some things like that. Some things don't. Um, there are some things that kind of need it. Um, there's some seeds that need like a cold stratification period. Um, Yeah, they, they don't want to germinate yeah, till it's 70 it's degrees. So to say a lot of like the, you know, like the brassicas and things like that, they're used to being dropped on the ground and they have to spend a winter before they can germinate. So it's perfect timing. My only big problem is sometimes I was so too many. Yeah. Or I've let something go to seed and I save the seed and then it's around for the next lot longer than I'd like it to be. <laughs> But yeah, I've, I've experimented with it. A lot of times the reason I don't is because I haven't made my crop plan until winter. And so I don't know where I want things until it's a little too late for me to get into it. I just do my whole list and then if I decide I don't need that many, I just save my funds. Yep. It works out well though. Did you have a question as well? Do you put them in like jobs? Job. Yeah, I do the jobs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, so when plants bolt, it's when they flower. Um, so like it's also important in things like cilantro and stuff. Basil is an important one because when it bolts, if you don't cut the flowers constantly, if it makes a seed, it starts to get bitter. And so that basil, which you're like expecting to make for like a pesto or something, will all of a sudden not have that same sweet basil flavor. It'll still be basil-y, but maybe a little more basil -y than you'd prefer. Um, other things that do it, like cilantro does it pretty quickly. Uh, cilantro is a fun one to grow, but the, there's a lot of jokes about it in the farming community. You have like a very short harvest window. I was watching a webinar once and this man's like, yeah, you know, we grow the slow bolting variety, which means it is, we get about 15 minutes extra of harvest window, <laughs> you know. Uh, but there are some, you know, when cilantro bolts, you do get, what is it? I always get, it's coriander, right? Yeah, so like there are other options where if things seed, maybe you have another thing you could do with it. Um, but yeah, bolting is definitely something to watch for. And that's also an issue with like transplant production is if they get stressed in there, they'll start to bolt. And getting them to unbolt before season can be difficult. So then just cutting the like, top off? Cutting the flowers they off. Keep, they'll, they keep bolt, they'll keep bolting. So you're going to have to keep cutting those flowers off till it's planted and realize it's happy again. <laughs> and sometimes that never happens, you know. It's one of those like once they hit their maturity, it's hard to tell them they're immature again. So yeah. Um, any other questions? All right. So I'm gonna go into how you can put some of these pieces together, and then we can also ask a bajillion questions afterwards. This is a picture of the front of my house in winter. Uh, blank slate. I, you know. I don't have a very big yard, as I mentioned. I'm standing under a very big maple tree that I've actually cut a bunch of the limbs off of because it was so shady that my front lawn wouldn't grow. Uh, when I moved in, there was no front lawn. So I actually put in this front lawn that you're seeing here. It's gray in this photo, but you know, it does turn green sometimes. I actually just consider it stuff I mow. So there's dandelions and other fun stuff in there too. This is it a couple days ago. Um, you can see all the herbs up front and a lot of flowers on the side. Uh, I've kind of done, uh, there's flowers up there, so it still kind of keeps up with the neighbors, but most of this is actually in tea and culinary herbs. My door that I use mainly is that awning on the side of the house, so this is the area that I can get to without getting my socks wet. Sometimes a little wet if it's really dewy and I have to get into this front bed, but um, it is slightly worrisome because as I mentioned, you don't want to be too close to the house for lead worries, but I'm just, you know, playing it. I'm just going to play ignorant here. Um, this is like one of the corners I plant really heavily on. You can't see it here. This is like the blank slate. Uh, this is it kind of coming up. And then this is it before most of the stuff has come up. So in this area, uh, this is actually south for me. This is my south facing. So you can see I have very minimal south um, activity. I probably should preface the first year I was actually in my house, I didn't plant anything in the ground. I did pots along the driveway. In 10 gallon pots, I did tomatoes and everything. It was important for me to see what's already there. Is there standing water somewhere? What's the light white like? How does it change through the season? Because I might see something like, oh, I get perfect sun here, and then not realize, oh, there's a neighbor tree that I did not think about that blocks all my sunlight. So sometimes, you know, waiting a bit if you like just moving in a place and like seeing what happens through the season might be a better thing than just 
pumping a bunch of money and time into planting things and then being like, oh wow, this actually sits in water in the spring and I didn't know that. Um, but in here is actually, I have thyme planted over here. Um, there's an oregano in here, actually two different varieties of oregano, a sage on the corner, there's strawberries mixed in. This stalk is from some fennel. Um, there's canna lilies that grow in the back, so like they still have the greenery and like, you know, block up, they go right up to this bay window I had put in. Um, and there's a few other herbs in here that I'm drawing a blank on. I have a couple varieties of chives in here as well. And a lot of these bushy plants that you see are valerian, which is a really good herb for tea. Um, it kind of self-seeded a little more than I like, so I'm pulling out a lot every year. Uh, the only problem is if you've ever smelled valerian, it's not a very fun plant to smell. Um, last time I actually dried some out, it actually I had COVID and I lost my sense of smell. I'm like, perfect, time to dry all the valerian. <laughs> um, you know, making the best out of a bad situation. So it's a, a great plant for tea. It's really good for sleep aid and things like that. But um, it throws a beautiful white flower as well that if you cut back flowers a few times throughout the year, so there's a bunch of options that you can do. Um, as I said, I, I've just kind of been throwing things in there without a whole lot of planning, which is probably not my greatest idea, but also is, because now I have all the things I want, always. Um, this is my garden actually a couple of years ago when I, when I first built this. And so a little story, as I said, I, I originally planted, uh, south is coming from this way. So I planted my veggies along here when I did my tomatoes in my pots and here. And I just kind of like waited to see what was going on. And then I slowly, as I got soil and everything, this area actually didn't have a double gate in the past. It had a single man gate. So this is south. So this whole area here was actually my main planting area. And then I had plantings here and then I put a little garden here. And then I realized I wanted a boat. Oh. <laughs> you know, so I wanted a boat. So I needed a place to put a boat. So I turned this man gate into, uh, you know, a, a full gate. And then I realized I can get the boat in, but I can't get it back out. <laughs> so I put in this post after I asked my neighbor, always make sure you have good relationships with your neighbors, you know, before I just put in a post that's debatably on mine or his property. I was like, hey man, I realized I can't pull my boat out by myself. Do you mind if I put a post in? He's like, no. Next day I had the post and he's like, you didn't waste any time. I'm like, I've been waiting to see you for a week. <laughs> Um, so I put in a post here and then I realized now I have a post here and I don't want to mow this lawn. Actually, he kind of mows this side because his backyard is actually about four feet wide from here to here. So he mows that just because he, he's got nothing, you know, it's his whole backyard. And I was like, actually, I'm going to do a garden. I'm going to extend the garden because I removed this part of my garden and I lost. So I used to plant all of my like taller vegetables here, like my tomatoes, my collard greens and things like that. But when I made this, I had some strawberries there already, but when I made this into the boat spot, that's now where my boat pulls its tires over and this gate has to open. So now I have this area with beautiful soil that I built up, but I don't have, you know, I can't plant anything tall. So these strawberries actually started to take hold and I've been letting them. I'm still eating strawberries out of my freezer from that little patch actually. Uh, I got a couple, like a half colander every few days through season. They're June bearing, so season's coming up quick. I'm very excited. Um, and so then I moved and this garden actually extended out a little more this year. Uh, within the last few days, I usually bury my compost. I bury all my food scraps in my yard. So I, every time I wanna expand my garden, I just dig out my lawn and put some compost underneath and that's where my garden expands to. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I was looking at this, I was thinking about it. Hey, the strawberries kind of self-selected there. They're short, my, my boat can still go over it. They don't get hurt, I get berries. Um, as far as how, like what vegetables I plant here, you can see I plant my more intense veggies. I plant a lot of the stuff that I want to uh, eat as like what I call car snacks. So like I plant like my uh, snap peas are gonna grow right here. I just planted them a little while ago. And then my tomatoes, I actually weave through the fence here and here. So that way when I walk out to my car, I can grab a few and eat them in my ride. Cause that's one of the things I like to do. Again, plant what you like and what you like to do. Cause Everyone's always like, what should I plant? I'm like, I don't know, what do you like to eat? They're like, I wanna plant something easy. I'm like, well, radishes are easy, but do you like radishes? Like, what are you gonna do with a whole bed of radishes? No one wants that many radishes. It takes 30 days to grow a radish, it's easy, but like, plant what you like. Um, so, and then 
behind this fence is actually my property from here to here all the way back. And then my neighbor has a sump pump that actually pumps right down here. So it stays pretty well irrigated. Um, so I plant a lot of my things that you plant once and then you come back and you harvest them. You don't do much maintenance otherwise than maybe occasionally I take my weed whip back there and like clean it up a bit. So that might be like my winter squash. I'll plant that, it'll grow massive, crazy, and then I go and harvest it. It may grow into my neighbor's yard. My rule is if it grows in your yard, you can have it. Usually that's good enough to let people not be angry at you for growing a massive plant into their yard. I also planted some asparagus back there. Uh, asparagus is something that's really low maintenance. If you've ever seen asparagus growing wild, it's usually on the top of a ditch. It likes to have its feet near water, but not in water. So I figured the sump pump action might, might mimic that. It's not doing terrible, so um, I might not be wrong. I might not be right. And I plant garlic there, because garlic you plant in the fall, you harvest, we have what's called escape, which is like a really delicious garlic green bean if you cook it, and you harvest the garlic uh, like a month or two after that. So it's a very like, not very often am I having to climb around the back of my garage and back up because I don't want to, but also I want to plant something there because you can see my yard's very small. Um, this is the, the expanded section. You can see some old sunflower heads, some garlic coming up, and there might be some other fun things growing up there. And there's a couple actually, there's some weeds that are really highly edible and nutritious. A lot of times you'll see those growing around my yard because I use those the same as I would other plants because they're delicious and nutritious and I don't have to plant them. Um, this is it, one of the first years I did that. This is patty pan squash growing at the edge of that. You can see there's that pole hiding behind it. Uh, and it did pretty well. You know, I can't eat that much squash. So I was giving it to everyone and uh, I usually plant squash on the ends because if you saw the soil ends right about here, but the plant keeps going. So it gives me more garden space without having to make more garden space. Otherwise, if I plant that in the middle of my garden, all of a sudden I lost my whole garden to this squash plant. How do you eat that? <laughs> what? How do you eat that? Uh, patty pan squash. They're, so they're a unique one. They're actually an immature winter squash. So if you let them go to like full term, you can store them for a long time. But they're, when they're young, the skin's really soft. You eat them like a zucchini. Um, the other fun thing you can do is they're really cool shape and you can hollow them out and stuff them. That's like the most famous way. It's really, it looks really cool. It's fun. It makes a real meal out of it. I only do it so much because like I can only eat one or two and it's like a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this is my south facing. Obviously you can see there's a, the house right behind it. So like, but it gets pretty full sun in the summer. The sun's pretty high up. So I still get like, this is my one south facing part. <laughs> um, there's a side you can see my boat behind it. There's actually a couple of them back there. Um, and that's where my strawberries are. And as I said, it works out. It's instead of lawn, they're doing okay. The only thing is I killed a few of them because I, I poured some water in the middle of winter on them and it melted the snow and they froze and just kaput. Um, here they are though, they've ventured into the crack between my driveway and my house. Probably not great for my foundation, but great for strawberries. So <laughs> I'm gonna let them do it this year and then I'm gonna move them back to the spots that I killed. But you can see they're flowering right now. Like this is actually a couple days ago. Uh, you can see all the flowers. I'm probably gonna get like a good amount of strawberries out of here. And these ones actually flower like a week or two before my other ones. So it extends my season because they heat up a little quicker. I think it's fun. <laughs> I don't know, I love strawberries, so I may be a little partial. Um, this is the garden in a weird, like, in-between state. Uh, I can assume this is probably, like, July-ish because I remember this spot is bare right here because uh, I may have mentioned how I bury my compost. When you have a really crowded garden, it's hard to dig a hole sometimes because there's plants everywhere. So a lot of times, uh, I also, I used to say I'm a lazy farmer, and my friend said, no, Josh, you're an efficient farmer. So I dug up my potatoes, which were planted here, and in that same hole that I had already dug, I threw my compost and recovered it. So I didn't have to dig two holes. I dug one hole, and I was done. Um, next to it, you can see like collard greens and sunflowers, um, mint in pots. Please don't plant your mint in the ground unless you want everything to be mint. Um, I love sunflowers. I actually don't usually get the seeds, even though I love the seeds because we have squirrels. Uh, I have to beat them, which is easier said than done in our environment. I'm not sure how bad they are out here. Squirrels. 
We have a problem. I have a problem with. I have a, just a real small raised bed. Mm -hmm. If something goes in there and nips all the buds on like zucchini and everything else. I'm not sure if they're doing it on the zucchini, but definitely like sunflowers and things. I wouldn't be surprised if it's a squirrel. Um, my actual funny story is so you saw there were stalks on the other side, and all of a sudden one day I noticed that the flowers were disappearing. And my neighbor came up to me one day and goes, I thought it was the kids, because there's about a dozen kids that run through my yard and stuff. And he's like, I thought it was the kids. He's like, and one of them's his. He's like, I was about to yell at him. And then I saw a squirrel run past with a sunflower in its mouth, and it saw me and it stopped. <laughs> just flower in its mouth and then just kept going. And I was like, yeah, yeah, it sounds about right. Uh, keeping them out is hard. Um, they're pretty small, so you can get through a lot of netting. Um, I've heard, you know, this, that, the other works. My favorite is people are like, oh, you know, hot peppers work. You know, hot pepper, you spray it around. I had them eating my hot peppers at Yad Ezra. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they were literally like, I scared out three squirrels eating my hot wax peppers. So like, I don't know if anyone told the squirrels they're not supposed to like hot peppers or if they just developed a taste for it, but keeping them out is easier said than done. I, I'm sorry I don't have a better solution for you. A fence can work if you have like a nice fence. It, it's more of a deterrent if anything. You know, the way I describe this, because usually people's problem is deer, is if before you make your garden you put up the fence, you're in better shape than if you do it after they've realized that you have deliciousness. Uh, the way that I accustom this is if you have a favorite gas station that you go to all the time and all of a sudden a construction zone pops up, you're still going to that gas station probably, right? But if you didn't ever go to that gas station before and a construction zone is always around it, you're probably never going to that gas station unless you're desperate. So trying to make it just maybe a little more hard to get to than your neighbor's hostas for like deer might be, might be your option. For squirrels, maybe it's something similar where you just make it a little more difficult on them. But fencing is expensive, hard, and makes, the, you know, makes it not as accessible for you too. So again, I'm sorry. I, if you find a good solution for them, let me know. Because <laughs> I'm still struggling with them. We have a lot of squirrels in our yard. We have fences, but they'll climb. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. So usually if I see squirrels out there, I'm like, let me out. But she's not so great with the rabbits. They eat everything. Rabbits are, you know, they can eat a lot of things. I'm lucky I don't eat many salad greens, so rabbits don't usually. Oh, yeah, they do like the, that whole, the brassicas and all that. It's, it's sad. My biggest problem has always been groundhogs, because if you get one of those, they can demolish your garden in like a couple days. Uh, groundhogs are everywhere. I don't know anywhere that doesn't have groundhogs. Um, I'm fortunate I haven't really had them at this house, but like when I was at my parents' house, I was taking out at least a couple groundhogs a year and I would just trap them and move them. Um, they do come back if you don't take them far enough, so you gotta take them far enough. There's a little niche, because I don't think you're allowed legally to transport them more than a mile, but if you take them less than a mile, they might come back. If you wanna know if they're coming back, you can spray paint their butt. <laughs> Um, it's not the nicest to them, but it's nicer than just killing them. Uh, I had one that I moved when I was at my parents' house where I was like, I swear I've caught this groundhog more than once. I was like, I swear, it's the same one. And I p painted his butt, moved him to the spot, and he beat me home. I got up, I went to go to the bathroom, and pulled up, and he's in the back with his red butt blaring, just eating my raspberries. And I'm like, he's going further this time. So, you know, again, Take things with a grain of salt. Pests are always hard. Squirrels I have found to be the hardest for me to deal with just because they're so small. Yeah. Groundhogs and stuff, you know, deer you can fence out with, you know, strategies. Obviously, deer can also jump very high, so it's easier said than done. I've had friends who have real farms who have like 12 foot deer fences and they've watched the deer jump that, which is the equivalent of jumping onto your roof. You know, like if you like put that into perception, you're like, how is that even possible? But they're Pretty strong animals, and if you ever walk the deer path, it's usually not very easy. So, um, pests are always easier said than done to deal with. Uh, again, if anyone finds a good solution for squirrels other than just like killing them, let me know. <laughs> um, here's my backyard. Um, you can see I, I put in a little fire pit. I planted raspberries along this stretch. Uh, this is actually the north side of my garage. Not my greatest idea, and I planted rhubarb here. It seems to be working okay. I think I have a photo of it afterwards. In the back along this back fence was a bunch of buckthorn. 
which if you ever dealt with is not fun, it's very vigorous, it's hard to get rid of. I went through with a chainsaw and loppers, got it, and then I, I do the strategy. I'm almost fully organic other than a few niches, which one of them is buckthorn, and when I cut it down, I take a paintbrush and I paint the herbicide on it, so that way I'm not getting any you know, effects other than where I need it. It's pretty effective, especially if you drill a couple holes in the stalk, or you know, the, the trunk. Um, so in the back, again, that's like, as you remember me with the zones, that's like my zone two. Again, you can see my yard's real small, but like, I'm not going back there very often. But, so I plant more like my perennials. I planted a bunch of asparagus back there. There's some strawberries, and my plan is to eventually either do grapes or raspberries back there or currants or gooseberries. I haven't really figured it out. It kind of depends on what just comes to me. Uh, sometimes I just let you know the universe decide what I'm gonna plant by what, what's available. Um, in the past, I did a lot of mushroom production in my house, like oyster mushrooms. And so I'd take all the old, um, what they were growing on, and I'd throw it in the back here uh, behind my uh, grill. It's pretty shady back there. And I would get fruiting sometimes. Now I don't do that. So back there is actually a wild, like, uh, Blackberry, like a wild black raspberry, that's been doing pretty well. Um, although my, my girlfriend's dog has ripped out all the stalks, so I'm not sure if it'll come back this year. But you know, that's a good use of that space. It shows that it wanted to be there, and I like eating those. So again, sometimes it, it might be you know things decide to be there, and you let them be there, or you choose to put them there. But it's all how you like to do things. As I said, I'm a lazy or efficient, however you want to put it, gardener, and. Uh, I like to kind of let things do what they want. Um, this is the raspberries a couple days ago, actually. I planted a few more here, but I'm not sure if they're gonna come up because I planted them at the wrong time of the year because that's when I happen to get them. Here's my rhubarb, which does great. I don't really eat it that often other than when I want to just like gnaw on a stalk. I could probably make a pie, but I'm lazy. Um, the raspberries do really well, actually. Um, these started as just two plants, uh, just little stalks about this big, and it's been a couple years and they're doing great. Um, I had a friend who has a raspberry patch and he let me have a couple stalks because if you have a big patch it really doesn't matter if you lose a few stalks. Um, and then there's also some garlic in here and a lot of times I'll do potatoes because potatoes don't like the heat either so a north side facing uh, shade doesn't always do them bad. They might not yield great but they don't die very quickly and any potato I can have is a great potato. Um, Here's the raspberries doing well last year. Um, actually, I think this was a couple years ago. So they actually did better last year than they did this in this photo. You can see from a little spot that I wasn't doing anything with, had nothing planted in. That's fun. I love raspberries and, and you know the berries. So like that that to me was a great success. And I, obviously I had berries for a few weeks here. Uh, you know, every few days I could go out and get a big fat handful, which it's not a lot, but if you price out organic raspberries, it's actually a pretty high value. Some of it may also be as you plant your garden, you know, what's the value of what you're planting? Um, to me, like I love onions and stuff, but like onions are so cheap. Like why would I do that? Whereas like organic raspberries that I know have not been sprayed, that's a pretty high value to me because I love fruits, but I also don't trust most of the fruits. So um, yeah, um, I, think, I think I had something else, but I think that's just about it. I left some good time for questions. If you guys have questions, I'm, I'm happy to field anything. It doesn't have to be just on what we covered today. Anything garden related, I'm, I'm happy to talk about. Yeah. Corn, I, I would like to, I'd like to grow corn this year. Corn's a fun one. You have to plant big blocks of it. Okay, that's what I thought. I, I've got enough room to put big blocks, and I was thinking, you know, I've been doing some research on it. Some people say 12, 15, 18 inch do like three rows or four rows. Three or four, four at like the, I do like the 16 inch spacing, give or take. Depends on the variety somewhat. Um, I love sweet corn. If you've ever had sweet corn like fresh off the plant, you don't have to do anything. You just eat it. It's so sweet. It's absurd. Um, huge fan of sweet corn. Just planting it is, you know, you need a lot of space for it. And again, to me, sometimes the value isn't as there because uh, it takes up so much space. But if you have the space, I'd say go for it. Just make sure you plant enough because it it's wind pollinated, which is the reason. Uh, at the top, if you've ever seen like the, what's called the tassels, mm -hmm. um, that needs to sprinkle onto that silk part of the corn. And each silk corresponds to one kernel. So you need a lot of pollen to be falling into that area. So as long as you plant it good and maybe occasionally go out there and just shake stalks if it's not windy out, 
um, help make sure that it gets good pollination. Does it matter? I mean, typically coming up to the back of our house, we get the wind comes almost the same direction almost all the time. Yeah. Does it matter if I plant them with the wind coming this way, this way, or this way? They should shake either way. Okay. You know, I'd expect because it's one of those, if you have multiple rows, the first row is going to block most of the wind otherwise, or if this way, it'll just shake the whole thing. I could be wrong, but I haven't seen anything that says that, you know, you should plant them. The wind's usually coming from the east. Always plant them facing east or anything. So as long as there's a big enough block, you should be good. And, you know, maybe expect some of them won't have, like, that full, full. You'll have a couple spots that maybe won't be perfect, but it'll still be delicious. Um, I have friends who also do like not just sweet corn, but they do like the dent corn and stuff and they grind it and they make like corn flour, which is a good way because a lot of times, you know, home scale, it's hard to grow. You can't grow like flour is really hard to grow and harvest by yourself. Uh, whereas you could make like corn flour pretty easily. And it's also a lot of people who are gluten free. It gives you an option. Um, but yeah, I love sweet corn. Mixing, mixing different? Corn varieties? No. Uh, you can, if you want to do it, plant them succession style. So plant them, if you check the days to maturity, if you have like a 72 day variety and a 79 day variety, maybe plant the 72 day variety a week before you plant the 79. So there's two weeks between when they'd be, uh, you know, like tasseling and, and doing all that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. Have you ever grown amaranth? Yeah. Which kind? <laughs> I don't know. I just uh, there's a bunch of cool amaranths. Um, also, if you've ever seen pigweed, which is a pretty common er, uh, weed around here, that's technically wild amaranth. You can eat that one as well. Um, I've also used those grains to do microgreens in the winter. Um, but so, as a, so I've I haven't ever processed the grain, but when I did like the microgreens, that was harvesting the seed. Some of that's because like pigweed had seeded in my fields and I was like, well, it's not going to drop the seed here. If we're going to collect it already, we might as well collect it in a bag and grow. Uh, I don't know if you know what microgreens are, but you grow like little baby plants and eat them that way in case anyone doesn't. Um, but yeah, it's a great way to get free seed too because um, microgreen seed isn't always cheap. Um, but yeah, I've grown it for the seed sometimes. I also grow what's called Love Lies Bleeding, which is like a bit, the one that looks like kind of like dreadlocks. I really like that one. It gets like you know, five to seven to nine feet tall and goes crazy and it looks beautiful and it does throw seeds at the end of the year that you could possibly try to harvest. Get away with doing that one in front. You could, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful plant. That's actually one of my favorite aesthetic plants and usually people always make a comment about it because it's, it's just so intense with how, how it grows. And I mean, to have something that grows this tall and then grows, you know, almost all the way back down to the ground is really cool. And I actually, some of the first jobs I worked were flower shops. So I love throwing together flower arrangements and having something that trails down is oftentimes hard. But if you can make an arrangement that might sit on the end of a table that goes lower than the vase and goes up, your arrangement is now instead of just this piece, it's that. And it's a much more big showpiece. So I really love things like the, you know, the Love Lies Bleeding. There's also the other, like a lot of ones that stay straight up. Uh, there's the globe amaranths, which make really good dry flowers. There's, I've, I love amaranth. It's a great one. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's still time to seed it. You can direct seed it as well. Um, I feel that. <laughs> it's a very common problem for me, too. And I stopped pulling the same places that I'm running out of The little spots that you could throw it over there? You just expand the garden a little bit. Our yard's not very big. Well, you see, mine's not either. Mine's bigger than that, but yeah. But I also have six people in feeding. Okay, yeah, so it makes it a little more crowded. I have a question. Um, grape tomatoes. Mm -hmm. Grown them for a long time. The trellising of it is a different event every year. How do you, because they can grow as tall as you. Oh, yeah. So What's the best, way to it? best, I can't tell you. I can tell you what I do. <laughs> I'm one of those people because everyone's always looking for me like, just give me a straight answer. I'm like, I don't have a straight answer. You can do this so many ways. Um, I do what's called uh, the Florida weave or like basket weaving them. So you prune them to a couple liters and then you just keep pulling off the suckers and mine can get like this tall before the end of the season. 
Uh, it keeps them really airy and flowy so that way they get less disease and things like that. You can see the tomatoes, picking them is easier um, and all that. It does take time because you have to weave them every couple weeks. Um, but it's not that terrible, especially if you don't have a bunch. For me, it sucks because I'll have like five 50 foot rows, you know, so like the, oh, let's do this every two weeks and it's like a few hour task is like not an easy sell in my brain. But, you know, it is a, it's relatively cheap. It takes a couple stakes or poles or people, a couple sticks from your yard and some twine. Um, you can use any twine you want. A lot of times I use the twine that's like more like the Baylor's twine that doesn't biodegrade. I know that doesn't sound good for someone who's all about environment, but the stuff that does degrade oftentimes will actually get uh, molds and stuff too. And tomatoes get a lot of diseases and you can actually spread some disease between your plants with the twine. Well, and I've had it where it dries out so much that it just snaps. Yep. So it's one of those like, yeah. Um, I use a lot of sage, and every year I try and plant sage, and it, it's supposed to come back, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It doesn't. I mean, I'm doing something wrong to my sage. What? Where are you planting it? A different places. Is it in pots, or is it in ground? Well, or? I started in a pot, and then I put it in the ground. Well, sometimes I keep it in a pot and put it in the garage. That didn't work. Yeah, usually you know, what ends up happening then is they dry out in the garage. Well, you put it, like, what kind of a... Like funny I mean, I've never had sage really I die on me. Sage is one of those to me, I, I feel like I can't usually kill it. Um, I've had sage, I, I hate to do that, like I've had sage where like I was at a farm and like I told people like, yes, till here, don't till here, and then till there. And they're like tilled specifically where I said not to till. That's where I planted sage and the sage lived through being tilled. So I'm not sure. I've always had decent luck with it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. Do, uh, do you have a, are you, what variety are you planting? Just standard common sage? Yeah. The only time I ever had it die was I decided I have a big one in my yard. Yeah. And I decided I wanted to plant it in the garage and I planted it in the garage. Oh, yeah, it works so great. I thought, well, I have some live for the winter when somebody gets a sniffle or stuffed up or whatever. And so I thought, I'll just grow another one in and then in the summer I'll just put that pot outside. It didn't like being in the house. I think it just got too dry with the heat on and everything. It's too dry, not enough light usually. Yeah, Even if it's in a window, yeah, winter light's not the same. It didn't do well. And it looked like it was almost dying. So in the spring, I was like, well, I'm going to just throw it out. I'm going to plant it next to the and other sage. If it doesn't survive, I'll get it out. Oh my gosh, it went crazy. Uh, yeah. So apparently it wasn't dead. No, they, <laughs> they, uh, they die back. <laughs> It probably did, did go dormant because I mean they, they go dormant you know during yeah, winter yeah. normally, so I'm not sure. As again, I haven't experienced my sage dying. I've killed probably more plants than rosemary. Rosemary dies every year. Oh, uh, it's so it's a, what we call a tender perennial. Maybe give us ten years when our climate changes and it won't. Uh, rosemary gets one zero degree night and it's dead, and usually we're gonna get a zero degree night. So that's one that you can sometimes get to live if you bring it in your garage and keep it from going bone dry all winter because your garage might not hit that zero degrees. Or you can bring it inside and hope that it doesn't fully kaput. And a lot of times what will happen sometimes is you'll bring it inside, you'll think it's dead, and you'll be like, I don't know, I'll leave it outside and see if it comes back. And it'll all of a sudden do better than ever because well, it I did go a little dormant. I got one of those ones at Costco that's like $15. For yeah, like little well, tree things. Like And so I would say, when you put it outside, it may all of a sudden bounce back better, and then if anything, just cut back some, if when, you, when it starts to bounce back, if you see like there's a bunch of dead branches, just yeah. cut those off, and then the ones that are alive should, should make up for it. it dies, it that's, so that's something that I really do endorse, is just try things. Uh, plants, you know, I've, a lot of people just think I have all these success stories, but I've probably killed more plants just this year than most of you will try to grow in your life. And, you know, that's how I learn is, unfortunately, sometimes plants have to suffer for me to realize, oh, I can't push them that far. Oh, or like, oh, I can push this so much further than I thought. So 
you know, don't be scared to, to try things and realize it does or doesn't work. It's not that you have a black thumb. It's that, you know, sometimes things work and sometimes they don't. Um, there are a lot of perennials that can be fun to, to play with. I am also a big fan of mixing in, as you saw, like perennials and things, because I'm lazy. I'm busy in the spring. I'm planting for everyone else. It's the old, like, plumbers always have a leaky sink. By the time I get home, I don't want to plant anymore. I don't want to keep gardening. I don't want to weed. I just want to harvest and like make myself a pot of tea and go sit down. My feet hurt. So, um, you know, being able to plant more things like herbs that come back that you don't have to deal with that can still help you out. You know, I don't use much sage, but I do use it for steam pots and for things like that or in tea. So like for me, it's a great one to have because even if it is winter and those leaves are dead, you could still go out there and they'll still have enough smell to make like one of those steam pots for your, for your nose. It may not be as ideal as fresh, but like it's still going to get the job done. Or you can dry a bunch before the winter and things like that. I just wanted to try the live ones. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely better when it's live, but it's almost like the leaves are still on there in the winter. It's still doable as long as you didn't chop it all back. Um, yeah. Well, I, I just don't think that it's going to have to 40 years. I live in California, so this whole gardening <laughs> <laughs> um, I did notice, just as an aside, that I had parsley. You guys are talking that it's common for the herbs to stay alive. That's amazing because I've got still have parsley and, and um, chives. Parsley and harvest year, soon. And you're saying that it's kind of common to have the herbs. Stay Some of them. So parsley is a biennial. So that one will uh -huh. grow one year and then it's going to flower very shortly. Uh -huh. So it'll do the bolting thing that we talked about. Uh -huh. So if you can. So, so I mean, it'll just keep flowering. It's just gonna go. Yeah, you can, or or if you want, just harvest the crap out of it. Before, you know, as soon as you see it starts flowering, and you know, freeze it or dry it or whatever, and uh, call it a win. Because. Yeah. So. So if you want to plant like tomatoes and stuff, and said, if you oh. want, we, we have the tomatoes and stuff at Yad Ezra and all the other veggies, which we'd be happy to give you. But I don't plant outside. This year it may change. Uh -huh. Usually my plan date, if I went back to like my crop calendar, I'm not planning to put my tomatoes in the ground until June 1st. June 1st. Everyone always says Mother's Day, but like that's still a little early for me. Again, this year might be different. We got a bunch of warm weather early. You know, we had those 80 degree days, but then it was cold and wet, so it stayed cold. But, you know, it's supposed to be in the 70s for the next couple weeks. Right. That should heat up the soil. Uh -huh. But I'd rather put them out there a little later and know that it's good enough than try to push my luck. The only problem with that is if you are going to somewhere like Bordines, their selection may be either better or worse at that point, right. depending because, you know, everyone else gets planting fever and goes and buys things oh, out. So to say, I otherwise I get farmer's market plants where I get most of my stuff, or as you saw, transplants, I grow most of mine. Or look on Facebook Marketplace because I list them all the time. Yes. <laughs> um, as I said, there are green forms there and a little QR code. We do have almost all the veggies that you could want and some flower seed and stuff like that that we provide. I know it is a little drive to Berkeley, but you know, we have pretty much everything. It's all donation based. So we'd be happy to give you all the plants. I have a lot more plants that need to be out than I have people signed up at the moment. So I'd be very happy if you guys want some or if you know anyone that gardens, because usually gardeners know gardeners. Um, feel free to send them my way. I, I really need to get these plants into other people's houses so that they don't bother me anymore. So where do you this the same, I'm sorry, oh. um, this okay. the same for um, flowers? In terms of it depends on the flower because flowers are such, a, there's so many different varieties of right. flowers that, you know, there's certain things we're throwing seed down right now is great and then there's um, other things where like, it's not time yet. Right. You know, like sunflowers and stuff could handle it. Things right. like that. You could probably even throw some zinnia seed out there. Right. Um, things like that. But like, I've got a lot of things growing in my garage under grow lights right now, which they don't really like that. They're very leggy. Like yeah, they're it's hard. A lot of times the grow lights aren't aren't enough for, you know, the, right. the real sun's a lot more powerful. Sure is. You know, it's also 
As I said, I'm using shop lights. Those don't have all the spectrum that they should. There's no UVA, UVB, things like that that help them maybe do some, some different transitions in their cells for things. I just put them out today because they're already oh. on the liver side. Well, I mean, you can put them out, and then there's also, like, it's nice to harden them off. So before you just take those transplants and just plant them outside, uh -huh. slowly for a couple of days, maybe take them out on a nice cloudy day and put yeah. them out there so they can get used to the wind, right. and then take them out on a nice day that's sunny, maybe not right. windy, and just slowly put them out for a few hours more every day until they're ready to handle it. Yeah. Because you can imagine if you sat inside all winter in front of a computer screen and then just sat out there on that 80 degree day, you're going to be sunburnt and they're going to get sunburnt too. So, one last question. Yeah. Um, you talked about burying your compost. Mm -hmm. So, you just make little pits and you bury your compost. Uh huh. So, I'm an avid composter. Yeah. I have one of those big, um, you know, black things that has the holes. Yeah. And I've got a so, nail straw next to it. And you do. So, you probably don't have to bury yours. Sorry. You probably don't have to bury yours. I, again, in an efficiency, I do a style called Bokashi, which is pretty much I take all my compost and I throw it in a bucket with a lid. Yeah, that's what I do too. Yeah, and then, then that's it. No, that's, that's where my process ends. It sits in there until I have a spot to bury it, and sometimes that might be six months later. Oh, well, yeah. And so it's just fermenting it. The pH drops to like 2, 3. It's not releasing methane or anything. It's just sitting there fermenting. It might oh, look wow. similar, but at the end then, it doesn't smell great, but it's still not going to hurt anything. You bury it, the pH bounces right back. But if I don't bury it, I'm worried about pests, sure. you know, coons, yeah. possums, etc. When do you make something like that that you're leaving Oh, it's just in like a, I do mine in like old tidy cat litter bins and half the time there'll be like three bins in my kitchen. They don't oh, smell unless you open them. Yeah. And, uh, so how long do you bury them? Like when, does it, when do you bury them? Uh, whenever I dig a hole. Like uh, all the time of year, I guess. Whenever I dig a hole. <laughs> I have, I know some people that'll dig a massive hole before winter and then they'll just go out there and knock some of the frozen snow back over or like frozen soil back over it in the middle of winter. I don't want to go out in the middle of winter. I just don't. So mine just sits in my kitchen or like sometimes in my garage and you know waits until it might be I'm harvesting potatoes or something or I did it recently because I was like damn my garden's not big enough I want to expand it a little bit. So I just dug some you know I went around the outside of my garden and I just dug a trench and I just filled it with compost. You know, it's not an exact science. It works well for me, and as long as I bury it, you know, more than a few inches down, I don't have issues with uh, pests digging it back up. I have been, there's been times where, like, I was the one, like, you don't want the compost from, like, when we went camping? I'm like, sure, and I get back, and I'm, like, tired after, like, a weekend of camping, and I don't bury it deep enough, and, like, it gets dug up by a possum. It's the only time I've ever had an issue because I, like, I was in a rocky part of my yard and I'm tired, I'm half asleep, I haven't even gotten in my house yet. I'm like, I don't want to deal with this. I only went that deep, they found it. But as long as it's a few inches down, nothing ever like, causes issues. It composts pretty quick once it's under there. It's already fermented, it's already pre-digested a bit. Worms will move in, eat it all. I mix in a little soil. If I have it, maybe some straw or something to help you know, add some aeration. But yeah, as far as timing, again, I, Whenever it works. As I said, I've got the big, big yeah, big those work well. Things. Yeah, and I'm, I'm anxious this year. It's been about a year that I've moved into my home, so to you know undo under the, the bottom and pull it out. Yeah. See what's on It'll the bottom. probably be some some nice you know black gold down there, and you know that stuff you don't have to bury. That stuff you can put on top. Yeah. Uh, you know, for me, I'm not gonna put my uh, what resembles literally my dinner six months ago on top of the, the soil. Um, I don't think my neighbors would appreciate the smell very much either. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my status on it. I love composting. That's actually how I got into gardening, really. Um, so it's, it's a big passion of mine. I think it's a great way. My, the way I see it is like I paid for all these nutrients. Why would I send them off to a dump? You know, like whether it be like an apple core, like I paid already for these. Why, why am I going to throw this out? With some plastic. Yeah, you know, so to me, that's, that's just free nutrition. Um, I don't do a whole lot of fertilizers for my garden, but that's also because most of my gardens are started on a foot of compost. You know, and not just regular, just like straight food waste. So like that's pretty dense nutrition. So in a few years, maybe I'll do it, or I'll just go through and a lot of times like, 
when I'm harvesting like potatoes or at the end of the year when I'm like digging things up, I'll bury compost back in the middle of the garden once I'm, you know, I kind of rotate through. I don't really have uh, much method to my madness. I just kind of go at it and I'm like, today's here. Or like I haven't buried there in a while or I'm like, ooh, I bet you there's worms over there and I gotta go fishing. <laughs> and like, I don't have, you know, yeah. Now, speaking of fishing, do you put your fish heads and all everything into your garden? Yeah. I, my grandfather used to do that. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, it's a great nitrogen source. I mean, I'm sure you've seen fish are pretty quick to break down. That's why they're so easy to eat. They're very digestible. Uh, I started, uh, I go spear fishing in the spring and get sucker fish. There's no bag limit on those. It's about what you can carry. Uh, and I'll smoke, like I smoked 35 fish this year. And you know, you can imagine that was just the ones that were like good, like didn't get got because it's speared, like got in a way that I could use them. And so like there's 35 carcasses and then probably 10 more. So like I buried all those, uh, you know, I go fishing throughout the year. So all those fish carcasses are definitely ending up in my, in my garden. <laughs> yeah. Is there any way to tell if seeds are good before you plant them? Um, if you have enough, you can put a few in a damp paper towel in a plastic bag mm -hmm. and see if they germinate. And then it also, like, let's say if you're worried about them molding, maybe a touch of hydrogen peroxide so that it helps keep, stave off any, like, fungus or anything that might, you know, sometimes you put something in a paper towel and it turns to that white fuzz. Yeah. Uh, but you can maybe wet it up with a little bit of hydrogen peroxide and just try it out. And then even if they, if you like are low on seeds and you're like low on space, you could do that and then take, if you see roots come out of them, you could take those seeds and then plant them too. It's a great way to also get them through that stage where they like need water constantly. Um, that's probably the best way. I'm sure there's other ways, but that's, that's usually how I do it. I'll do like what's called a germination test. And sometimes in the past I'll do things where I'll like count out 50 seeds put all 50 in the, you know, in the paper towel and then count how many germinate. And then you can calculate germination rates because there's certain times where like, especially with our garden resource program, like I might have seed that either we saved ourselves or I bought and it's a couple years older than I maybe, I, I was like, oh, but what is it good? So I'll give it a test and I'll be like, if the germination rate is over 80, 85%, I'll consider it good to do. So like to know if it's 85, you have to go through the the technicalities. For your home garden, you're probably like, one out of ten is great, I can plant it, you know? But for me, I can't give out packets of seeds where one out of ten is good. I gotta do it where, you know, people aren't gonna have success. Do you recommend doing that with the seeds? Doing the paper towel with the water thing? No. Not necessarily. Not unless you're really trying to go for germination or it's a really hard to germinate plant. Okay. Um, I, again, in the name of efficiency, to go from paper towel to soil right. in a plug to outside is too many steps. Yeah. I want to touch things as few times as possible for efficiency sake. So into that cell they're gonna be in until they're outside is ideal. I don't even like to do many up pots. It's too many, too much hassle, too much handling. Yeah. I ain't got time for that. If you saw there's thousands of plants in there. If I have to up pot all of them, that's just way too much time for me. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. A whole bag. So I just threw them in one of those metal trays with dirt. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're growing. Plants now. Yeah. <laughs> Which, what, what, what do I do with them? Plants them. <laughs> but I mean, they go out. Um, like in this weather, they're yeah, Potatoes, it's cool. actually, we're a little bit late almost to plant potatoes. Yeah, I'm so actually, I looked at my schedule and I was like, ooh, I'm behind my planting well, potato the time. Side, on the north side of the house? Or they, anywhere. I mean, cooler. They, they don't, I mean, that's just for me. When I'm planting it in the field, I don't have, you know, ideally my entire field is in the sun. So sometimes I'll plant them on the side of the field that maybe gets a little more shade just because I know they can handle it and I know that my tomatoes don't want to be there. Um, but the potatoes can go anywhere. Just expect that you'll be harvesting them, um, you know, earlier. They're not going to last for the entire year. As soon as it gets hot, they'll start to get diseased. Almost all potatoes get blight, which is what caused like the, you know, the potato famine. So as soon as you see that they're starting to get these weird little sores on them, keep an eye on them. And when you see that it starts working its way down the main stem, pull them. Oh, you don't want... What's the best time to plant? Uh, like, early, yeah, like, uh, like right now? Yeah, like a week ago. A week ago? Yeah, yeah, like a week ago, two weeks ago. Yeah. Um, 
for the first time I've seen someone try to do like a, I don't, um, like a silvery metal line on the ground beneath the tomato plant. So hoping that the reflector from the bat to, is that successful? I've never seen it until recently. I've seen, so. Is that? I haven't you seen see that, that as much. Sometimes people will put red underneath tomatoes because sometimes it confuses bugs. Um, something that is something that I've seen people do is there's black and white plastic. And so if you have something that likes the heat, you put it under black plastic. And if you have something that likes the cool, you can put white plastic on it. I haven't seen the silver used yeah, as much. I know what you're talking like, I guess in theory, yeah, it would reflect light and it should be able to photosynthesize from the underside of the leaves. You know, ah, is it worth it? I don't know. I'm a big fan, you know, like doing the plastic mulches can be nice, you know, if you're worried about weeds. I have certain areas that weed pressure is so high that like it might be worth it for me to put plastic on. I also try to avoid it because, you know, plastic waste, etc. Um, I'll use a lot of times the really heavy landscape fabric because I can use that for like 15 years before it degrades and 15 years is a long time for me. You know, like that's a lot of gardening years to, to get out of something, especially value wise, whereas the plastics, you're going to get a season or two and then you're going to pull it out, you'll leave some of the plastic will stay in your soil, all that. But I've never seen those. I'm sure if I looked, yeah, I well, would. This person did the experiment. I was going to say, they probably saw something on, you know, yeah, so I on, yeah, you know, TikTok, etc. I'm like, in theory, in theory, yeah, but then also like tomatoes like warm soil. So like you're also reflecting all the, the energy away from the soil. So you might end up, yeah, they're going to photosynthesize more, but the soil might be cooler. But maybe in 90 degree summer, that's great. But right now, if you were to put it out there, that's that's bad. So like I know some people that put like black plastic underneath their watermelons because watermelons like really hot. You know, or like eggplants, like the heat. So like it gives them an extra, their soil heats up about a week or two earlier and then it cools off like a week later. So that adds almost a month of growing season, which makes a difference for something like watermelons, which is barely long, like we barely have a long enough season for. So getting that little extension can sometimes make a difference. Do I do it? No, but I also don't grow melons because it's a hassle. <laughs> I like love melons. I eat a million melons when it's melon season, but like trying to tell when they're perfectly ripe, beating the rodents to them, like, oh, yeah. you know, like also it's one of those like, especially if you're at a home garden, it takes up a lot of space. And if you get four melons and you like try one of those melons and it's not ripe yet, that's one of the worst feelings ever. Cause you're like, I just ruined a quarter of my crop <laughs> by not doing this. And then you wait too long on one of them and it gets musky and you're like, I just ruined half my crop not harvesting this right. And then I was going to say, then a mouse eats one of them, so you end up with one melon out of these four melons, and it's not even that big, and you're like, I could have bought a $3 cantaloupe at the farmer's market that tastes just as good. So again, it's my concentration of, of whatever, because I can eat, like in peak season, I'll eat like a melon a day, like a watermelon a day, especially if I'm out in the hot sun. Like it's hard to eat in the hot sun, but I can eat a melon so good, and then I'm hydrated and all that. So. I love melons, but to me, I found that it's easier for me to go buy them from the farmer's market when it's good season. I have like, you know, one of the dealers who I know has really good melons. They're good at it. Melons actually oftentimes are on like a really heavy feeding schedule from a lot of these people. Um, I've talked to some farmers and their feeding schedule is almost on the same like breadth of like cannabis farmers and how intense it is. And like, they're really like on this date, they feed this and on this date, they feed that and all that. So it's like, I'll leave the science to them, you know, I can taste it in their fruit, that it tastes fine, you know, so I'll leave that to them, but I wish I could grow melons. <laughs> I think we didn't talk about is like fertilizer, I know you talked about compost, any so, additional fertilizer? I'm a big on the organic fertilizers, my other main thing is soil tests are really important if you want to know what to do, if you're blindly adding things, you might already have way too much magnesium or something and you're adding a fertilizer that's high in magnesium and you're just messing up ratios because what happens is most of the micronutrients play off of each other mm -hmm. so if you have too much of one thing it you might have enough of something else but it's oversaturating it so if you do a soil test and maybe get some recommendations or something like that you can better apply fertilizers instead of just blindly throwing things at it 
Compost is the only thing where you can kind of blindly throw it at it and you'll usually come out okay. Um, if you start blindly throwing some of these other things, it can be iffy. Uh, I'm not a fan of most of the chemical fertilizers. Most of them are salt based. Salts don't help biology, kind of kills them. So you're kind of like, it grows quickly, but then you killed everything. So you're kind of stuck in that cycle where you need another, you know, it needs more fertilizer. Um, I also like, I did do some of the organic fertilizers for a while, but like most of them are like bone meal, feather meal, et cetera. And I'm like, well, is it really organic if I'm getting byproducts from a slaughterhouse that's not organic? So it's one of those, like, how far do you want to go with this? And <laughs> a lot of rabbit holes that we could jump down, which is why I try to keep the soil one a little shorter. But my moral of the story is compost is great. Um, you know, micronutrients and, and balancing them is really important if you want to get like really into like getting proper flavor and avoiding disease and things like that. Um, a lot of times your disease problems or pest pressure may be from a deficiency. So like something that where it happens a lot here is you'll notice like your kale and your collards and stuff will be doing great. And then as soon as it gets cold, they start to get aphids. I don't know if you've ever experienced that. All of a sudden it gets cold, that soil dropped beneath 50 degrees. Your calcium cycle is done by microbes. It gets beneath that 50 where the microbes are active. Your calcium cycle stops cycling. Uh, you're already probably deficient, but the cycle, you know, the biology was able to keep it up. And then your calcium makes cell walls thick. They stop making thick cell walls. Easy for bugs to eat. Mm -hmm. So it's sometimes it's like looking at things in a different way of like, why am I getting this past what could be the root cause? Similar, like if you're on a plane with someone who's coughing, you're not guaranteed to get sick. If your immune system is great, you should do all right. But if you're already kind of immune compromised, you're more at risk. So it's a similar thing to that. So uh, soil tests are important. You know, uh, I use what's called Logan Labs. Uh, they're out of Ohio. You can do like MSU and stuff. Logan Labs just has a more intense soil test that does like all the micronutrients and things like that. Um, and uh, you just online look up Logan Labs and you like can send it to them just in like a Ziploc bag through the mail. Oh, I see. They do it for you. you send it to your yeah, you send your soil to them and they just they do it all. You can do them at home, but a lot of those like those kits are not always as good as you hope, and usually they're just testing for the top few nutrients. Um, you know, it's all like things like pH are also important. I don't know, I don't have it here. There's a graphic that shows like where nutrients are soluble at different pHs and you'll see the reason they say like that <laughs> 6, 2 to 6, 7 is important is because all the different curves kind of overlap there as being available. So like oftentimes clay soil ends up high pH. So you have some nutrients that aren't as available just because of the pH. So trying to mitigate that pH with something like sulfur and get it back might be your best solution. So again, it's, it's kind of like most things where you kind of want to look at it deeper before you just start blindly throwing things at it. Obviously, throwing fertilizer at it will probably make it grow better, but like, will you also cause problems where, like, as I said, like if you grow in straight compost, a lot of times you'll, it'll look great, and then all of a sudden you'll be like, why is everything in trouble? It's because they built, like if you build a house way too quickly and don't take the time to make your foundation strong, you're gonna crumble away. So, yeah. Any other questions? And I said, feel free to, you know, my email is just josh at yadesra.org, so if you think of anything later, feel free to email me. Yep. Yep. And we put all the leaves in there to see mulch with them because then Perfect. Chill and it makes, oh yeah, it's great. I love, I love using the leaves. Um, free resource, everyone throws out their, their wonderful leaves <coughs> at the curb. I don't know why, I'm stealing them. <laughs> we, we just tell our neighbor, don't bring your leaves if you leave them in a pile, we'll just bring them in the builder. I'll make them right, in our right. Boom. Yeah, it works really well. I'm, oh, and yeah, your, your ideal. Yeah. I said like, I've done things where a lot of times uh, I'll reach out to like a landscape company and they'll, they'll be like, hey, I got as many yards composted in the back as you want, you know, happy to drop them. And so that's oftentimes a great way to get some fertility. And also, as you said, it's a mulch, fertility, it's not too rich. It's just a, a great resource overall, especially I think peat might be going illegal in the next few years. Like we won't be able to get peat moss. So 
as we look for other options for that, you know, Coco Quar is out there, but that the price on Coco Quar will probably skyrocket, and it's already kind of hard to get at this point. Uh, Coco Quar is usually pretty washed out. It's relatively, relatively. Usually they'll throw in something to pH balance it too, but like, what are we gonna do? And like, to me, it seems like leaf mold would be one of the best options to to look at instead because it's here. It's, you know, people are trying to find a place to put it anyways, so um, I would suggest, you know, that might be a good option for, yeah, for people looking forward. They're a lake, like they weren't on a lake, but they had friends at work, and so their friends, when they would drive to the duck, the they would dunk it in their yard, and they would just pick up that. It was awesome. I mean, that's a, that's a great one, too. I mean, that's not a resource most people don't have available. I've uh, looked at doing some composting with that. It's... Uh, as long as you can get it quick enough and start using it before it starts to turn into the stinky goopy mess, yeah. you're in good shape. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they, they ran a PFA, so they used Oh, yeah. Way. Okay. Yeah. As I said, like, it can be a lot because it's when they dredge, it's not a small amount that they're pulling out. And for a homeowner, that's, uh, you just filled your entire yard three feet deep with uh, bottom of the lake muck. It's going to smell like it. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks for coming on.